why did you and and uh, Tony Brown and Colin Lasky decide to pursue your case further? Why did you appeal? Right, well, we did what are the normal appeals that we've said, which is just the um, appeal court, which is in the Strand, mm -hmm. and that was okay. They reduced the sentences. Um, in my case, from three years down to six months. Okay. Uh, which meant you'd only serve three months, in fact, because you'd, uh, assuming that you behaved, you uh, would only serve half your sentence. So that would be three months. I'd already served six or seven weeks in the first prison, so right. there was only a, like, a few weeks to go, six or seven weeks left, something like that. And, um, <clears throat> but we appealed to the House of Lords initially because, as I said right from the beginning, we never felt we'd done anything wrong. Right. Nothing wrong at all. Um, so I didn't want them to win. I mean, in the earliest days, I thought about suicide and things like this when I was My in gosh. those sort of deepest depressions. But two things kept me going about that. One was my partner, and I realised wow. that would upset him um, a lot. And the other was, to me, that was giving in. Yeah, that w they would have won. And what, made, what would have made that worse is they wouldn't have given a toss anyway, even if I had committed yeah. suicide. They'd just say, yeah, well, they are, another bloody queer strikes, that no. sort of thing. So that was what determined us to keep going, the primary one being that we didn't feel guilty of anything. Right. And we wanted to pursue it as far as we could to get our convictions overturned. So we appealed to the House of Lords, uh, which was the highest court in this land at that time. And... Uh, that hearing was held about a year after we got the uh, bail from the prison. Um, and uh, then the judge, we had to wait on there. That was attending, we had to go to a court, which in my case was the Old Bailey. Um, but there were no judges present. We were just surrendering while the process was going on. So because they're officially a court, the House of Lords, you then still have to surrender to them. Okay. Which meant you still had to go into London and sit in a cell oh, I see. while they deliberated during the day. Uh, and then you could come home at the end of the day. Hmm. Uh, so they did all that. They did their thing. And we lost by three votes to two. And the interesting point there is the three that voted against us and said this sort of thing has no place in a, quote, civilised society like Judge Rance quotes, were the oldest three. Yeah. I think uh, you can look up their ages if you, you really want to, but I think they were like 70s and 80s, that sort of period. And the two that were prepared to um, accept our appeal were both in the 50s. Okay. So already, even there, with that small age difference, you could see a, a difference in outlook. Yeah. Um, so, but we lost. But then, um, that's when Tony and I and Colin, now Colin had served his whole sentence initially, he didn't ask for any bail or anything. Oh, Tony and I still had some sentence to serve, yeah. so we both agreed we'll serve it now, the okay. remainder, because we said what we don't want to do is to go to the European court and if we lose there then have to go back to prison. Yeah. So we said we haven't got very much left, we'll do our prison, this was when we went to the second prison. Did I say Brixton for the first one? I did. My mistake. It was Wandsworth was the first okay. one. That was the appalling, awful one. We went to Brixton Later. after the House of after the House of Lords thing okay. um, to serve the remainder of our sentence. Yeah, sorry, Brixton was actually not too bad. How much more time did you have to serve? Well, that was the remainder of sentence, which because the appeal had reduced it, um, amounted to another. Four months, I think, okay. or three or four months, something like that. Okay. Time off from the first prison, which was about five or six weeks worth, okay. plus time off for the time you sat in the cells during the oh, all right. various hearings and so on. <coughs> yes, so we both decided that we didn't want return to prison hanging over the final results. So we said, right, we'll go back to prison and serve off the rest. And actually, it wasn't too bad at all. The whole wind was quite pleasant. The whole atmosphere was far better than Wandsworth, which was the first place, which was an old-fashioned Victorian prison. Wow. So we appealed to the European Court. We then, you can't appeal directly. 
you have to appeal for. You have to ask for um, right to appeal to the European Court. So leave to appeal, I think they call it. So we applied for that. By that time, we got um, Liberty on board, mainly due to one of their officers, a really splendid lady, who um, sort of championed our case with them. They weren't terribly keen because they thought our case was a bit of bad publicity, even for Liberty, because of the nature of its crimes. Um, and uh, so they were on board. We then had quite a bit of support um, from some lesbian groups, okay. there were some lesbian ladies, uh, there were some SMA type ladies and gents as well. That's when the SM world, that's when they started doing odd marches and um, parades and things and try and raise interest. Um, so we got a lot of support coming along then. Um, so we decided we would appeal to uh, leave to appeal, to, and they said yes. To uh, whom do you uh, take to, this? To the Court of Europe. You then go to the Brussels, the European Court in Brussels, and apply leave to be heard by them. I see. It's, I see. it's okay. the. Um, I think our grounds were right to a private life. Oh, okay. And okay. Things like that. Uh, okay. I can't remember the detail, but it's all out there in public record. Um, and I couldn't go because at that time my mother wasn't at all well. Um, so I stayed in England uh, doing a couple of radio interviews uh, and generally keeping an eye on mother. Um, and they all flew off and came back. Um, and we won the leave to appeal. So that meant it would be heard by the full European Court, which is 15 judges. Right. I thought that was a slight irony, seeing as with 50 defendants of religion as well. But even then we weren't that confident because our chief, um, I can't think what you call him, some sort of barrister, uh, was uh, Lord Leicester, who was a liberal peer and was well known for sort of his liberal attitudes. And almost from the beginning it was telling us all, oh, you don't really stand much of a chance. Um, England, well, the UK have lost quite a few appeals in Europe, the European Court, and they're sort of due a win, as though it's a sort of, you know, tit for tat arrangement. Oh, and okay. So he doubted that we would have a lot of luck. Um, and when we finally got to the court, it was just Tony and I, because by that time, unfortunately, Colin had died. Oh. And that was a big shock. I announced oh. that at one meeting one day that we were having with um, one, uh, one of the London pubs where we used to meet. Um, and there was a gas put up around the room. So Tony and I did his obituary for the pink paper, I think it was, maybe possibly even Gay Times. <coughs> and um, so it was just two of us by the time we actually got to Europe. I see. Um, and Lord Leicester's presentation on our behalf was, we all agree, pretty abysmal, to be honest. Oh, uh, and it's oh. like he was defeated from the word go. And it came as no surprise when the final ruling came that we lost 15 nil. But otherwise a close run thing, <laughs> apart from 15 nil. Well, why do you feel his, yeah. his work was abysmal? I, I don't think he had his heart in it for a start. And he didn't make any of the points that our barristers were trying to get him to make. You see, mm. he takes precedence because he was the main presenter then. The court also didn't like the fact that we had so many legal types with us because they reckoned there was too many were just two defendants, I and mean, we had about four each. Was, but a, a lot of this was people like the solicitors coming along for a jolly. Oh, know. wow. Wow. <laughs> and that was sort of frowned upon because this is all that European court expenses type of thing. Incredible. So they weren't keen on that. Um, now, his presentation, we didn't feel, was very good. Um, whether it's because he realised it was <laughs> that we wouldn't stand a chance. By this time, you've got to remember that. Um, European court included countries like Turkey and similar sort of if like Eastern European that do not have great human rights records in their own yeah. uh, accounts so they're not really likely to be that sympathetic. Turkey was certainly far more sort of Muslim based and yeah. that sort of feeling so not very keen on us so not, we weren't surprised when we lost 15 years. 
But as I said earlier, it didn't achieve what the police had hoped, which was to stamp us out of existence. All it did was get people's heckles up. And uh, in the gay world and the SM world and the leather world. And um, you know, we got support from all over the world really. Um, What, what exactly did it entail being at this European Court of Human? At the European uh, Court, yeah. it didn't actually, from our point of view, Tony and I, it entail very much. We didn't speak a single word. Um, I think we might have just acknowledge their names or something like that. We were allowed a written presentation to the court each, which we did, but that was in advance, and we, we didn't read them out for ourselves. So whether they actually read them or not is anybody's guess, there's no way I know yeah. anything like that. So it was pretty much a, a closed doors thing really. Few arguments were presented, it didn't last anywhere near as long and it was over in half a day. Oh, very quickly. It was a quick thing. Oh. Yes, we, it wasn't days and days, it was like you know, oh. one day's worth of here's your presentations um, and um, then back the following day to wind up I believe. And then that was it, we'll let you know, is sort of, if you like, what happened after that. So, very little real involvement from our point of view. How long did it take before you had word? Now, that I can't remember. Quite a delay, about a month, I think, or something. Okay. Which, for anything legal, is actually, I suppose, fairly quick. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, quite a while. How did the other uh, defendants feel about you taking this further? No, it was said anything to us. Oh, okay. We didn't discuss it with them. We really couldn't see why more of them wouldn't have joined us. Exactly. I think I can't basically they just wanted to put it behind them and forget about it. Yeah. Uh, they obviously didn't feel this, quite the same sense of injustice about it all that we three did, which is why the rest of them all dropped out. I mean, don't forget, only five of us went to Court of Appeal. So it was only us and two others. Um, and they dropped out at the following stage. So. In fact, one of them couldn't appeal to the European Court anyway because he wasn't a European citizen. He oh, was Swiss. Got it. <laughs> got it. So, and his um, partner, as the, he then became, um, he didn't want to do it. So it's their choice. But we three did because we felt it was wrong. Interesting, though, even with uh, Colin being deceased, you were yeah. able to bring him his case along with you, I find that interesting. We, we brought it along, but virtually if he, obviously there was nothing admissible that he could provide because he's not there to admit it. So yeah. he, couldn't have, he couldn't write a statement or anything. All that could be done was mentioned in passing in the submissions by Tony and myself and perhaps his name cropping up occasionally during the, um, the other one. Oh, interestingly enough, the gay women and so on. They had also um, lodged leave to appeal to the European Court, but their one was turned down. Oh, wow. So they said, no, we're not here, because they'd said that their private life was being interfered with, but they were turned down. So, but it, it probably worked as a technique, because it acted as a sort of slight distraction from that case, if you like. So they thought, well, scary. we could turn this one down and let that one go. So it looks like we've done something. What happened to Colin, if we may interject that? As far as I know, Colin got a heart attack oh, I see. and died fairly suddenly. I see. And we, we were quite shocked to hear the news. Yeah, of course. And, and we went off to Wales for his funeral. Got it. But we didn't go back for the reception. We were invited by the family back, which we thought was quite nice. But if, uh, there's only a few of us went, obviously. About three or four of us, I think, went. Um, but we felt it was really place to go to his family reception. I don't think we'd have been overly welcome. That was a nice gesture on their part, for which we thanked them and that was it. The whole process mm. took, what, 10 years? Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. And that 10-year period was an absolutely tumultuous time for you, for the others? It was stressful. I mean, you, yeah. it's not 10 years of total misery. I mean, you had sort of happy days. And we might have the odd holiday and things, but for instance, I'll give an example of holidays. We'd book me perhaps a surprise somewhere abroad. We used to like Greek islands, places like that. And as soon as the aircraft wheels left the runway at Luton or wherever, I felt on holiday. Um, 
and it wasn't the real world anymore. And I was fairly happy throughout the holiday, pretty much until the wheels touched down again, and then it sort of sunk all over me again. So oh, yeah. it, there was a sense of detachment being on holiday, and yeah. I could cope with that. But even then, so I spent a lot of time sleeping. But that was because of all the drugs and things from the medications. Sure. Yeah. Now, I recall you saying earlier that at some point they took your passport from you. Yeah. So clearly, that was it. Was that, that, that returned? Was, with that was thing? after the court of appeal. Oh, okay. Yes, we got it in the Strand. We got it back after that. Oh, okay. Prior to that, I'd had to report a couple of times a week to the police station. Okay. But I did it regularly, so they stopped that after a short while as well. Okay. As long as you play by all their rules and regulations. But you said at some point some of your things never were returned to you. No, no. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I have the forms such that I could apply for them even now, but what's the point? Yeah. Essentially, I don't want to get involved with the police again. Yeah. So yeah. there's no point in going back to the police saying, you know, oh, I'd like some pictures of me in my 20s. Got um, it. A, they probably haven't still got them anymore, and B, it just gets the police interested in me again. That's a good point. And I'd rather stay away from them, thanks. So I, I can remember what most of the pictures I lost, not just of me, but of other people and things. I can remember all of those because um, it's imagery. I'm quite good at remembering the images. Mm. It's him. And then he. <laughs> but you're, you're, t you're taking this all the way mm. to the, the highest court in Europe. Yeah. It just, to me, and I, I should think to possible viewers of this video, simply is, is mind-bogglingly uh, amazing because the fortitude, the... Well, you'd be surprised what a sense of injustice can do yeah. for you. I mean, it's like families that pursue things for years over the death of a child or a, uh, you know, a parent or something. And yeah. they feel that if people feel there's some sort of injustice with regards to perhaps a loved one that's died or been murdered or whatever, it's surprising how much ordinary folk can do when they feel like that. I mean, there was that um, Manchester, uh, no, not Manchester, Cheshire bombings, I think it was, or something, where some lad was killed and his father wrote books about it, met the bombers years later, and people said, we don't know how you can do it. But I can see how he can yeah. do it, because he had a total sense of injustice, and yeah. he should never have lost his boy in these circumstances. That's what drove him on. You know, the injustice can make you do all sorts of things. It's only when you sit back in retrospect. I mean, I couldn't do it now. Yeah. I don't think I've got any oomph left. All my get up and go has got up and gone. Which is why I don't do marches or prides or anything anymore now. I just want a quiet life yeah. now. But it was important to me at the time. You know, and it was the right thing to do. I'd like to feel that. And from yeah. what people have said, they tend to agree. I mean, when we were in um, Brixton, we got about 60% of the Daily Mail's letters and things came in to us too, Tony and I. Um, cards, letters from people all over the world offering help, you know, offering support and um, so on. And it did make a difference. It made a big difference to have our rules plastered with all these postcards and uh, yeah. read the letters from people that we've never met saying about you know, how they supported us and so on. So that kept you going, that sort of thing. And even the people, a couple of the wardens on the wing said they didn't see why we were there. They said as well, we had much worse people than we had you two. Wow. So, you know, we didn't feel too bad about it in that sense. But it was nice when it stopped. <laughs> mm. How did your partnership survive this? This had to be the most stressful, amazing thing in the world to put upon a partner. Um, I th once, we got, once we got past the original... Um, anger with me and then the anger with the system. While he, he is himself said that he wouldn't have pursued it as far as I did, he could understand why I did yeah. and then he came to admire it and so on and, and offer me his sort of support. And we did keep going, I mean we had lots of ups and downs but I don't think there was seriously near being splitting up at any time to be honest. That's amazing. Um, because we're, total, we're totally f committed to each other yeah. and we're totally loyal 
we're not totally faithful, but we are totally loyal. <laughs> and um, neither of us would want to live with anybody else, to be honest. Um, but that's what binds us together. And we are still here together. And to me, it's amazing. And now, as we get older, of course, into our old age, um, we look after each other. We have health problems now. We're there to support each other for health problems. So that's what we do now. How do you think future generations of SMers are going to benefit from your legacy? Hopefully, and when you say my legacy, I'd like actually to say the legacy of myself, Tony and Colin, really, because it's a three That's of fair. Us. And to me, it's just as important they're recognised in this as well, because it's the three of us who work together to achieve what we achieved, which in the end was little in terms of the law, but quite a lot we feel in terms of attitude and also in terms of people not being prosecuted again because as I said there's been no further prosecutions along these lines. Um, <coughs> the world is flooded pretty much with internet pornography of one form or another. I don't even like the term pornography really because to me naked people is what people are. It's just like clothed people only without clothes and and so they want to screw or do anything else. It's what people do. I mean, how do they think the bloody world population got here? Yeah. And um, the idea that somehow that this could corrupt people, I find amazing. Um, I think violence corrupts more than sex corrupts. Yes. Um, I've never heard of a, well, very few gang mentalities with regards to sex. So, so I suppose that's not really true with gang rapes and things these days. But um, I'd like to feel that we've made life a little more comfortable for people in the SM world, not just gay SMers, but straight MSers, all people that are interested in what you'd like to term kinky sex. But um, why not? You know, it's, it's fun. Um, yeah, if you've got half a brain, you have um, safety words and things that you can use, phrases. if someone doesn't want to go too far with something. If you're a psychopath, you're going to be a psychopath, whether you've got access to this sort of stuff or not. As far as I know, there are no sort of um, gay cannibal groups, for instance, but nevertheless, you still have cannibals out there, so That's it can't true. be much to do with the filming. It's got <laughs> to do with the state of mind. So the thing, um, as I was, when they told me I would, uh, one of my questioning sessions by the police, that I was, if you like, spreading this sort of stuff and making people do it, and that it's, people don't like this sort of stuff. I said, well, I don't like cricket, but I don't stop people watching it. Yeah. They and boxing came up quite a lot, of course, during the course of the trial, because of the harm it does. And we, we pointed out how people died quite regularly from boxing over the years. Um, <clears throat> oh, they also included things like uh, what they called horseplay within the armed forces, yeah. um, quite a few of which amounted to a fair degree of torture, but that was all jolly manly stuff, so it was all right. Yeah, you see, and there was a, there was a married couple where the bloke branded his initials <laughs> on his wife's bum, and that was all right as well because she yeah. consented apparently. That was just after our case, yeah. but as we said, if that had been if it turned out to have been a bloke branding another bloke, even after that case, they'd have been done again. So there is still some to overcome, but I think we've helped to um, sway the balance slightly. And these days, I don't think it's too bad being gay, but every gay man and woman struggles with their own coming out into the world, yes. telling their friends in the world. That's never going to change because, um, because of the way we are. It's just, you know, you can't be in... Um, an hereditary gay person, you have to start from a base zero every time, yeah. virtually. If you're lucky, you'll have understanding parents and friends and it will be a smooth transition. Um, when we were in um, Brixton, one of the people there was uh, a chap who had in, been involved in the um, rape and murder of a 14-year-old rent boy that they picked up. Mm. Uh, and this bloke in the prison was weird. I mean, we're perfectly 100% normal compared. There was something about him that was just odd. Tony saw it, I could see it. 
Yeah. You know, it's within some people that there are going to be people who don't function the way the rest of the people do. But yes. that doesn't invalidate what we do, because yeah. we do it, hopefully, sensibly and sanely. Yes. You know? Even though I've been officially declared, uh, what was it, the phrase? I've forgotten, it was on the T-shirt. Um, no, can't remember. <laughs> Tell me what got you through prison. You you mentioned there were three things in particular that got you through that ordeal. Yes, it, I mean, um, it was really the thought that was there. My partner was there. Um, he visited almost as often as was possible, which is about once a fortnight, something like that. On a couple of occasions, he brought other friends with him. Um, one of whom was um, one of my ex-music group chaps, a bloke I used to work with. Oh, wow. And he said that he'd never realised that people lived totally different worlds to his. He'd all, because he'd had a functional, loving family, and then he came across all these people in the prison waiting rooms and all the rest, so that was a shock to him. So knowing that was coming was always important. Um, and a sense of humour, which is somewhat laconic at times and somewhat just dead embarrassing, um, kept me going. And for thinking about when I leave, um, looking forward to driving my car again, because I used to love driving. Oh. Um, not so much these days, but certainly then, when I've had sports cars and things. But there was one other thing, um, was the library, the prison library, because I used to look in that to see if there's anything worth reading, most of which was not. Oh. But there was an interesting book about um, hill walking uh, in the Lake District and so on. And uh, I was reading through that and I came across a, a quote or a sentence that was actually to do with if you're on a walk and the weather turns bad, things like oh. that. But I'll just show you what it is. And we had this sort of notebook, prison notebook, oh. that I kept. And uh, the quote I wrote down, which really I treated as my mantra for while I was there, nothing acts as a better incentive than the knowledge that there is no alternative. So that really keeps you, you know, no matter wow. what was going to happen to me there, um, I knew that there was no alternative, so you just have to keep going. In other words, don't give, don't let the bastards grind you down. Yeah. Quite difficult when, you know, you think someone might be going to attack you. I mean, it was a bit unsafe here and there. Only a couple of times did I get into a slight spat with one or two people. Um, on the second occasion, um, my cellmate there, I didn't know this because I'm not a habitual criminal, but apparently you look up, you look after your cellmate, you know, for this sort of um, buddies, buddy style relationship. Um, no matter what they've done, or nobody talks about their convictions either. Certainly not out on the landings and amongst the general populace. Oh, Although these oh. days with newspapers and things, well, I say these days, sorry, those days, <laughs> with newspapers and what have you, they pretty much knew what people were in for. I mean, you can hardly have a newspaper saying 15 gay men convicted and sent to prison, and the next day, or the same day, half a dozen people turn up. Uh, I mean, all one or two uh, cartoons and things in the press, but so that kept me going. That because there is no alternative when you're in prison, you know, right. you've got to go through it one way or the other, and that kept me going pretty much. Of that, along with knowing my partner was there for me on my release and looking forward to hurling around in my car again. So that was that yeah, very important part. Some people <coughs> have asked me to bring up the next topic, which is, do you feel that you, perhaps you and, and maybe posthumously some of the other people should receive some sort of compensation for all the hell you've been through? We didn't go into any of the appeals for money. Um, we did it because of the sense of injustice about the whole the prosecution. Yeah. Um, I can't help feeling that these days a lot of, if you like, I call them malicious complaints against people with all these um, historic charges that get brought about all sorts of topics now, assaults and sexual and all the rest of it. it I just feel a bit uncomfortable with it that quite a few of them are in it for the money that they hope they might get. The only time that money really got mentioned 
was when we were heading for the European Court. This is the full hearing, not the um, leave to appeal hearing. Yes. When we're heading for the full uh, court, if we won the case, um, then it was thought we should be due some compensation. I see. <coughs> Excuse me. However, um, Lord Leicester, the um, I don't know if he's a, I'm not sure what level he was. I suppose he's a barrister. Maybe he was higher up than a barrister. Um, he advised against it. He said, generally speaking, even if you win, the European Court are not keen on you claiming compensation. Um, and this was quite hard to take from the bloke that only a few weeks earlier had told us that he would only take 10 grand for doing our case instead of the usual, obviously much higher fees. And it just seemed a bit sick and a bit ironic, I thought. So that's the only time that I'd that either of us had thought about money as being involved was if we'd won, okay. would we be due some? But there's no point in pursuing it. Oh, okay. um, you can't actually pursue for any claims if you've lost. Because oh. what's to be lost? I mean, a, another example of where things are not um, designed to help you if you're com uh, raided or convicted or whatever, just after the raid, I rang the... Um, it was a burglary helpline, oh. and um, oh, they were quite nice. And they said, and, and when were you burgled? And I gave them the date, and, and this, that, and the other. And then they said, and, do you know who was burgling you? And I said, yes, it was the police. <laughs> they mm. took all my stuff away. Oh, well, I'm not really sure what to do, but now I don't think we could do anything for you. You know, it's not really how it works. Wow. And I said, why not? And that's what it felt like. I said, the burglars were in the house talking to me and taking the stuff away. So it's probably more traumatic than if, well, I had had a burglary um, some while after that we got burgled. And that was less traumatic than the police raid and taking stuff away. Incredible. The only fight we had then was with the insurance company. You didn't want to pay out. So wow. that, that, that was all right. I just reported up the line to his upline mansion until I got satisfaction. Yeah, good. <laughs> so that, that, no, there's there's no point. Um, that's sort of, in my heart, it'd be nice if um, the Spanner Trust was to offer some sort of little something. But what's the point? I mean, we're not actually poor. Um, we don't, I mean, it's like the, this new thing about paying for your TV licence for pensioners. We could afford that. It was just nice not to have to. So, you know, from that point of view, we live within our means. They're fairly modest these days, so it wouldn't make a lot of difference unless it was a few million, and I think the chances of that are millions to one against. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, money not money was not a motivation, really, at any point. When it was all over, yes. how did you take the next steps in your life? How did you move on? Well, it was a bit difficult when it was all over. Um, my poor old partner, he thought like as soon as I'd come home from the final block of imprisonment and then we'd lost in Europe, which was about the best part of a year later, I think, to him that was the end. Okay. But it didn't work out like that for me because, um, well, I suppose it I just couldn't get back to normal quickly, or what would be considered normal. I got I actually got more depressed. Um, it was the most depressed I've been since the original trial. After it all ended, um, it sort of caught up with me because in the interim you're fighting. Yeah, it's a bit like a bereavement. You know, when the person dies, yeah. um, whoever, if you're involved in the funeral arrangements and all the rest of it. You're so busy with that and all yeah. the legalese, you don't really have time to grieve. Um, and that only hits you afterwards, yeah. you know, like when you've done the wake and everybody's gone home and you're just sitting there on your own. So it's afterwards is when, if you like, grieving for my loss of, I don't know, character, everything else, that's when it set in. So actually I went downhill for about the first year after... Um, it all ended, but then it sort of, it sort of gradually picks up then because we did start doing more holidays and things. Did you have difficulty sort of reassimilating into your community? Were were you? Did you feel you could 
participate again in friends and activities and... No, not to a great degree. It's, 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 during this period that I really stopped going to London. It was, I started to dislike my fellow travellers a lot because in, in the interim period of the, from the previous ten years, they'd all become noisier, louder, more drunk, especially if you come back late over the evening. Um, you just got more loutish behaviour in general the later the trains you've got on. And I was getting too old for that. I, could, I didn't want the aggro of having to move seats and all these other things. And How did you feel about your SM community? Were you able to return to that? No, not really. Um, I, I still had and still always will have an interest in the SM side of life. Um, but I don't have the, how should we say, the desire in quite the same way that I used to have. Um, I, I just can't get out of the back of my head that things might go pear-shaped again. Uh, and I know I'm not alone because Tony um, said he felt the same after the case had ended. He said he never really felt comfortable doing SM in the UK again. I mean, wow. He had quite a lot of friends in Germany and um, he'd feel all right in Germany. I mean, I went over with him to meet some of his German friends um, and they'd done a beautiful sort of send-up of the trial uh, with a judge and all the rest of it. You know, it was actually really good. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know what where I've done with it. <laughs> Oh. But, um, and I think it was in German anyway, which might not help. Yeah. But uh, I, I know exactly what he meant. He never, he never felt quite as comfortable. Um, so I, I worry that, for instance, I'll be in someone's address book and that the someone might get in some trouble for something they've done with someone else. Uh -huh. uh, this sort of chain effect yeah. again. And suddenly, let's say person X5 down the line <clears throat> had, had been done for, I don't know, underage kids or something, yeah. then they'd join up all the dots and they'd be back round again, you know, and I, I just couldn't cope with that sort of thing again nowadays, so no, I still think about the SM world, I look online quite often to see what's going on, but actually our um, online SM world has been pretty much sterilised out of existence by changes of UK laws and things uh, on pornography. Uh, uh, um, the one source that used to be quite good and free was Tumblr. Yeah. But they removed all their porn not long ago because that was much more niche. You could have little niches within Tumblr. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. And sort of realistic ones, not like the niches that the heterosexual world think we ought to have, <laughs> which yeah. is how most of porn's run nowadays by the sort of straight world. Um, so, and I haven't really got the courage to go back to clubs. So part of me would like to. Um, and also, <laughs> I can't stand as much pain as I used to. Oh. I mean, um, I really can't. Yeah. You know, whether that's an effect of, I think it's old age slightly, all your skin gets thinner, so you've got no padding for a start. <laughs> Everything bleeds much more quickly. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, no. I, I like the idea of it all still, and mentally I can still play games and have good dreams and things. Um, but in practice, I'm not sure how well I'd I'd get on, and I'd only have to meet one sort of if you like wrong and to sort of collapse me down to a heap again. So best left alone. I do occasionally. I do mean occasionally now go to saunas just to see a bit of stiff willy now and again, you know, it cheers you up to see them, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> but even that, I can't, that's, they've changed. And I don't have the energy either that I used to have. I mean, I was telling you before about, you know, like carrying on for hours and hours, and so I can't do that now. No. Lose interest, you think, oh, why bother? <laughs> you know, might as well just go read a book or watch the telly. Uh, um, so, no, not really interest that I had at all, um, other than keep a sort of bit of an eye on it and that's it really. Okay. Yeah. Some of the people in the community yeah. have said that you and Tony Brown <coughs> and uh, Colin Lasky yeah. are heroes yeah. for having taken a stand 
and f fighting back against this injustice. Right. How do you feel about being called a hero? Embarrassed. Really? To be honest. And I don't think any of us think of ourselves as heroes. We uh -huh. think of ourselves as um, unjustly put through the legal system <coughs> for no real good, achieve nothing for anybody. Yeah. Um, the vast majority of us, and us, certainly us three, had good professional jobs. What has that achieved? It's removed good professional people from the workplace, yeah. is what it did. Um, nobody's indispensable, I know, but what was the point of just getting rid of people that were good at their jobs yeah. for what they did? Um, well, in their bedrooms or something similar. You know, it's like I was saying about the school teacher that the police um, informed the um, governors after this, his immediate head had sort of said nothing to do with us, your private life. But the governors then sacked him. You know, it's, yeah. it's that sort of slight vindictiveness that I don't like about the whole system, and I still don't like it. I just wish they'd leave the gay world alone a bit more. But then that's what everybody says, all the drivers say, can't you go and get the real criminals? You know, everybody says go and get the real criminals, whoever they are. Well, of course I'm one, aren't I? Because I've got conviction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, in 2000, yeah. you received the Leather Archives and Museum's Centurion Award yeah. in recognition of your significant service to the 20th century leather community. Yeah, that was lovely. That How was you really not brilliant. Okay. I feel brilliant about that. I mean, it's one thing to feel embarrassed about, if you like, sort of hero status, but it's quite enough to actually get something. It's rather lovely. Um, it makes you, it reinforces the fact that it wasn't all a waste of time. Right. And that there are people out there who thought it was a worthwhile stand to make. Yeah. That's which true. we did on moral grounds because we knew it was iniquitous and uh, so yes it was lovely and we've had uh, a couple of other things there was a, a gay times top hundred people list I think around the same time when we were in that uh, and that sort of thing was very nice yeah. mm. <laughs> what's the biggest misconception about you that I'm a dangerous pervert in the eyes of the public and the press. Uh, uh, to be honest, I'm a very safe pervert. <laughs> but you are a pervert, yeah? Oh, well, yeah, <laughs> even, well actually, it's a, I'm not sure it's a phrase I like, but I don't mind. Okay. Um, I do <laughs> like doing things that I feel will upset um, the religious people and similar type, sort of head-in-the-sand folk. Um, but then I've always had a moral code okay. that I work by. Um, and I have told the police this, this was also in my statement to both the uh, Appeal Court, the House of Lords, and to the European Court, none of whom I expect read them, but there you go. Yeah. It's alright saying the system says you can submit these, but nobody knows whether these people ever read them. They probably don't bother. Yeah. <coughs> uh, and there wasn't a lot on my moral code, to be honest, there's only three points which I can't remember so I'll have another look in my little book okay this was a, a notebook I had when I was actually in the nick yes and wrote in it and um, moral code sorry do you want to please say something right. no no please right never harm anybody that was and harm I mean mentally harm um, that's, that's different from hurt Hurting people is part of their same thing. I didn't see anything wrong with that if they were happy. <laughs> but harming people such that you screw them up mentally or make them in some way go off the rails, I wouldn't ever want to do that. <laughs> Never do anything without consent. Now consent can, doesn't have to be written down or to a degree even said. The mere fact that you're there together in a particular, if you like, game situation, SM situation, means they've consented because they've turned up um, as I've said previously, people have safe words, yes. if they've got any sense, and um, and also the other thing is always try to help people. I've always tried to help people. I help people when I'm out and about with the dog. Um, I just try and be helpful if I can. It's not all appreciated by my partner, mind you. He says, stop interfering. 
<laughs> that's the nature of knowing someone for years and years, as opposed to a stranger you can help for a few seconds, you know. Uh, I mean, I help ladies at tills where often peculiar amounts of change so that I get a 50p piece back or, or something, you know, and they get all of a muddle. Uh. Um, I don't know if you do the same sort of things in America, you know, you've got something in a few cents and you think, well, if I give you an extra half dollar or something, you know, then it'll make it easier for the change. Okay. And of course, yeah. what it does is confuse the poor folk uh, and it ends up as a mess, but it doesn't matter. I make people laugh in um, hospital waiting rooms and anywhere, you know, I can make people laugh with silly remarks. Yeah. So that I enjoy. I think that's all right. I don't think that's against the law. I think it's wonderful. Unless they're driving a bus or something. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. When we were preparing for this interview, yeah. you told me <clears throat> that the time had come <clears throat> to put this issue to rest. Yeah. Do you truly feel you've made peace with this issue and that when we are finished here, that you truly will put it to bed and be done with it? I can never 100% put it to bed on the grounds that it was part of my life, if, even if the fact you don't talk about it um, <coughs> and it doesn't come up in conversation at all. At the end of the day, it's something that did happen to me, yeah. did affect me. Um, but that's not the same as having to do like um, regular discussions about it. I mean, when this is um, interviews done and out in the world, I should worry about that to a degree, but then I'm a born worrier anyway, so of my nature, if you like. Um, it was much the same when um, I had the um, little film done by Charlie Lyon, mm. which, uh, Last in Marks, which was also put out, he won an award for it because it was such a good little film. Um, and I felt nervous after that, but nothing happened, you know. Uh, so I probably am worrying about nothing, but that's a sign of someone who's got a slightly depressive nature, if you like. They look on the black side of things rather than um, the good side, but no. I'm hoping, I mean, already I've pretty much forgotten all the dates of everything. I mean, that's a start. For years I used to remember every date of like, the events and the court cases and the this and the that. Um, I struggle now to even remember what decade things happened in quite oh. often. So from that point of view, yes, it will slip to the back. Yeah. Um, so yes, it'll be there hovering somewhere at the back. As I said earlier in regards like meeting new people and things, I shall always worry about this chain of connections. Um, and that's it. The other, uh, the other advantage, of course, is with things like um, contact groups on the internet and stuff. That's fairly anonymous more so than things used to be. So one-on-one -on -one with people on that, they don't even know your surname, let alone where you live or anything. So as so long as I end up visiting people more than having them here, I, I don't feel comfortable having people here anymore. I can see you know, that. I just mm -hmm. feel more nervous than I used to. I mean, I couldn't do that now. We haven't got the curtain. Uh, <laughs> I hope you didn't tear it down for a dress or something. But... No, no. <laughs> No, I was never into cross-dressing. <laughs> I went to the visitors were. I used to have a couple of schoolgirls in quotes that oh used to come gosh. along. Um, they, had, they were very naughty. They had to be just <laughs> on a fairly regular basis. One of, one of the, and he was, a, he was a small lad anyway. You know, and he was always terribly guilty after he came. <laughs> <laughs> he'd, rush, he'd rush off out. My gosh. Anyway, there you go. I think a lot of people in the gay world are failed heterosexuals, oh. <laughs> is what I call them. They don't do proper gay sex as I see it. They just do what they think is gay sex, which is a bit of wanking and that's pretty much it. Yeah. Know, and they, they, yeah. they, they're like puddings, a lot of them, you know, passive yeah. like dollops who do nothing. And I think, can't yeah. be bothered with this, you know, it's got to be a two-way thing. <laughs> but it has, they've got to be keen and enthusiastic, yeah. which I used to be. Hmm. <laughs> I think I feel a bit more interested already. If it's a nice day, I might go down <laughs> one of the scratch wood or somewhere. <laughs> anyway, that was it, yes. I, I would like to conclude this interview <clears throat> by saying that I truly lack vocabulary adequate to properly thank you 
for all that you've done and that you've accomplished with this, with your life, and for SM people all over the world. Truly, you've challenged me, you've inspired me, and taught me how to be a better interviewer in enabling me to come here and meet you and conduct this interview with you. And I am so grateful to be entrusted with this information, with your personal history, and these intimate details of your world. And I'm honored to be able to meet you and to come here and to do that. And I would like to say on behalf of Inside Leather History, a fireside chat, and SMers the world over, I thank you, we thank you. Thank you very much. That's really very good.